easiest way to quickly validate Feynman's conclusion that the spin to wobble ratio is 2 is experimentally. For this, I have taken footage with a high speed camera after throwing a plate in the air. Let's take a look. Was the spin indeed faster than the wobble? Let's slow it down even more. At this point, note the left side of the plate is down. Then, as the plate spins, you see that after half a rotation, the left side of the plate is once again down. Now, as the point we are tracking completes one full rotation, we see the left side is down. Hence, qualitatively, it seems as though Feynman is wrong. That is, since the plate wobbled twice in between one full rotation, it appears as though the ratio of spin to wobble is actually one half, not two as Feynman asserted. Or, said in another way, the ratio of wobble to spin of a rotating plate is two. Now that we've seen some experimental proof that Feynman reversed the ratio of spin to wobble, let's delve into the mathematics and physics of the problem to back up our observations. To solve this problem, we will need some background info. The first step in solving this problem mathematically is by noting that, unlike most introductory physics courses lead one to believe, the angular momentum of a spinning object may not be in the same direction as the angular velocity. That is, the relation angular momentum equals moment of inertia multiplied by the angular velocity is generally not the entire story and is in fact only a special case of a more general solution. Instead, we must replace this equation with the given generalized version where the middle matrix is defined as the inertia tensor and holds the products of inertia. For example, we can imagine this product of inertia as the x component of angular momentum when the angular velocity is in the z direction. Now, based on the axes we choose, we can make this inertia tensor more like the elementary definition of angular momentum that we already knew by finding the principal axes of a particular object. That is, given any rigid body, there are three perpendicular a principal axes such that when the angular velocity points along any one of these axes, the same is true of the angular momentum. So, the inertia tensor reduces to just a diagonal matrix. This is where we get lucky, as it is easy to find the principal axis of a rigid body that is axially symmetric about a particular axis, because that particular axis is in fact a principal axis. Therefore, if we model the plate as a disk, then we see that the first principal axis, which is in the direction of the unit vector E3, can be easily found, since the mass distribution around this axis is unchanged by any rotation about the axis. Then, since we know that at this point there must be three perpendicular principal axes, we say that any two orthogonal directions, which we will specify as unit vectors E1 and E2, will serve as the other two principal axes. Now we are ready to set up what can be regarded as the rotational version of Newton's second law, the Euler equations. Note that to simplify our expressions as much as possible, we want to use the principal axes of the body as our coordinate axes, since this simplifies the inertia tensor. Therefore, we will have a body frame where the coordinate axes are the principal axes, and a space or inertial frame where the axes are the traditional x, y, and z axes, and Newton's laws hold in their simple form. Note that the uppercase gamma gives a torque on each axis, and omega gives a rotation rate of the body axis relative to the inertial or space frame. Now, if we look at a plate thrown in the air, we see that the net torque on the plate about the center of mass is zero. So, since the third equation also simplifies to omega 3 dot equals zero, we see omega 3 equals a constant. Then, rearranging the simplified equations, we see we can easily solve them as shown. Note here that capital omega is a constant since omega 3 is a constant. Next, differentiating the first resulting equation and then using the second, we get the equation for a simple harmonic oscillator. This is a great result and is exactly as we expected. Since we are in the body frame, this implies that the omega processes about the symmetry axis E3 with angular frequency capital omega. But what does this say about the inertial frame? First, it is important to note that since there is no net torque on the plate, the angular momentum is a spatially fixed constant vector that any motion will be relative to. So, converting to the space frame, we get the shown relation depicting the angular frequency of E3 as it processes about the angular momentum. Then, after simplifying this result, it is clear that E3 processes about the angular momentum with respect to the center of mass at a rate of two times the third component of angular velocity. But since the third component of angular velocity is the spin of the plate, and the precession of E3 is the wobble, we see this result is exactly as we observed qualitatively. That is, the wobble of the plate is twice as fast as the spin. But enough math. Let's look at a simulation of this. Here I have created a program that uses the Euler equations presented earlier to model the motion of the plate. Using the Euler equations, we can solve for the rate of change of the principal axes with time. Then, using that rate of change, we can step through time in small increments, translating the angular velocity in the body frame to the space frame, 
thus showing how the orientation of the disc changes with time. Freezing the simulation, we again see that the spin to wobble ratio is as expected since the E3 axis rotates with half the period of a spin of the plate, as represented by following the path on the x-axis of an arbitrary particle located on the plate. Other important features that are displayed in the simulation are that in the space frame, the E3 axis, which is shown along with the omega vector, will rotate about the angular momentum with respect to the center of mass at the same constant rate. In the body frame, this is equivalent to the omega vector and the angular momentum vector rotating around the E3 axis at a constant rate. Next, let's extend the simulation to see what happens with another asymmetrical object, a cone. Not surprisingly, we see that the disk was not a special case. That is, any asymmetrical object will wobble since in the body frame, and as shown in the simulation, the angular velocity vector and the E3 axis rotate about the angular momentum of the object with respect to its center of mass. The only thing that varies is the ratio of the spin to wobble because the principal moments will be different. Note here that based on the graphs, we see the ratio of wobble to spin for the cone is actually close to what Feynman incorrectly predicted for the plate because it looks like it is a little more than one half. This makes sense, as when we solved the final equation we found in the derivation earlier for the precession of E3 around the angular momentum, but used the principal moments of a cone instead of a plate, we find that the ratio of wobble to spin should be exactly 6 elevenths.